Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey guys, welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. My email address, jason at sportspectrum.com. Love to hear from you. Any guest ideas you have, any thoughts on today's interview with Karen Kingsbury and her husband, Don, would love to hear what you think of today's show. Email me, jason at sportspectrum.com. And we are presented today by Ronald Blue Trust. All of your financial needs, any questions you have, Man, I want to direct you to Ronald Blue Trust. They do great work applying biblical wisdom and technical expertise, helping their clients make wise financial decisions to experience clarity and confidence and leave a lasting legacy. Check them out over at ronblue.com, ronblue.com. Today on the show, we welcome Karen Kingsbury, the New York Times bestselling novelist. If you read Christian fiction and sort of that family style type of books. Karen Kingsbury is a legend in that world. Like I said, New York Times bestselling novelist. And her husband, Don, also joins us. So Karen has a sports connection here, I promise you. She was a sports writer with the LA Times and also wrote for the LA Daily News. And her first book, Missy's Murder, was published in 1991. And since then, she's written more than 100 books, novels, or short stories, 25 million plus books in print. That's legendary right there. Karen Kingsbury, a New York Times and USA Today bestselling novelist. Her and her husband, Don, were married in July of 1989. They have six children, including three adopted from Haiti. In 2017, Liberty announced the opening of the Karen Kingsbury Center for Creative Writing. How cool is that? Her husband, Don, is actually a basketball coach and spent a few seasons at Trevecca University in Nashville, has decided to kind of take a break from coaching right now. He was a high school coach in LA, Vancouver, and Nashville, and has over 30 years of coaching experience. So we talk coaching, we talk writing, we talk Don and Karen getting together. They actually have a pretty cool story, and uh, really a great sort of moment took place too with Karen's newest book. It's called Someone Like You. It was released May 5th. And as we all know, it was released in the midst of a pandemic. So she had to pivot and figure out the best way to get this book in as many people's hands as possible. But actually what ended up happening is she helped save a bookstore based upon her release of Someone Like You. She's going to tell the story. You don't want to miss it. Right here today, Karen Kingsbury, New York Times bestselling novelist and her husband, Don, join us here on Sports Spectrum. Take a listen. Karen and Don, welcome to Sports Spectrum. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited to be here. So good to talk to you both. I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, let's start uniquely enough with the pandemic. Um, this is we're kind of starting to see the clear, the clear, the light. Hopefully, at the end of the tunnel of getting out of what we've been kind of quarantined in for the last few months. But I'm curious for you what this time was like. Um, cause for me, Don, you're a coach. I know you're not necessarily coaching exactly at this moment, but you've been a coach for many years. So I would associate you with sports and being a person who's out there doing, you know, coaching things, recruiting and being around team. And Karen, as a novelist and a writer, my presumption is you do a lot of work independently. So I'm wondering for you both, how this pandemic has been for each of you. We'll start with Karen. Well, you know, as a writer, you're right. I do spend a lot of time at home. So in some ways, it shouldn't have phased me. Um, I'm, I'm on deadline and I'm supposed to be right. I should have written three books in this time, obviously being home. And I'm pretty much an extrovert, which is a weird combo to be a novelist and an extrovert. Uh, so but instead, it was like there was like just like that fear in the air. And I really didn't feel afraid. I mean, we, I memorized more scripture, honestly, That's but good. I didn't get a lot of writing done. Um, I had a book release, so I spent time on that. And then we started a movement as a family called You Were Seen. And that's really what took up a lot of our time. Tell me about the movement real quick. What was that, You Are Seen? And then Don, I'll ask you about your experience with this. Or maybe it was a combined experience. (laughs) Yeah, totally. It was. Um, Youwereseen.com is the website. And it, um, it kind of revolves around a pack of scene cards that say You Were Seen. So what it is, is it gives us a chance to go out every day and be an evangelist the way Jesus called us to be. A lot of times you might go to a restaurant and leave a good tip and like say, God bless you. But like, where does that go? Yeah. And this happened to be our experience for years as I was on the road. And 
I just felt I would be, I might sometimes leave a restaurant with like tears in my eyes thinking, ah, there's a connection I missed there. And so we, we came up with this idea of the website gives you um, a really kind of new, beautiful storytelling version, short version of Salvation. And it links to the Billy Graham Evangelical Association website for the actual plan of salvation. We actually have free Bibles. We'll give if uh, someone gets to that point on the website and clicks it and lets us know they want a Bible, we'll send them one. The cards um, are, are just a really nice high end look to it. It looks very current. The website looks very current. Yeah. Um, our design team did that. And so, yeah, so it's just a way to make everyone into an evangelist, go out and maybe it's the clerk at the store or the you know, cashier, the barista, the police officer, the person who's the delivery guy, whoever it might be, just to say, hey, you were seen, you matter. Thank you for what you do. And, and you know, if it's appropriate, where it's appropriate, a very generous tip. Mm, that's really awesome. Again, you said it was uh, youwereseen.com is the website. You can go check out and learn more. Don, what's this been like for you being a basketball coach, kind of being quarantined and stuck at home? We've talked to a lot of coaches during this time and they've had to pivot and figure out what the heck they're going to do now that they can't go out and actually have face-to-face conversation. And thank the Lord he, he invented or he invented or helped people invent Zoom so we could have conversations like this. But what's this been like for you? Exactly. We all spend a, a lot of Zoom uh, on Zoom meetings with other coaches and just talking what they're doing and, you know, just sharing and going over offenses and defenses. And, and I actually took the last year off of coaching. So uh, my spring was going to be different anyway. But talking to, to friends that are still coaching, uh, they just said it was hard because you can't, you know, you have a limited window anyways to meet with athletes. And then on top of that, you, you really couldn't fly anywhere and couldn't see people face to face. And yeah. And uh I just can't imagine if, if, you know, if you're a head coach of a big major university and things are going on, what, what you know, you would have been thinking of. Oh, it's crazy. I just I can't even fathom trying to recruit during this time, trying to do everything, putting game plans together. It's got to be insane. Now, you might hear Don's name and think, yeah, he's associated with sports because he's a basketball coach. But Karen, you actually were entrenched in sports early in your journey, weren't you, as a sports writer? I was. It was the craziest thing, Jason. I was uh, a senior at Cal State Northridge University, and I I was applying for internships like anyone else would be doing their senior year, and I ended up getting an internship at the Los Angeles Times, and the only opening that they had was sports. I had done a couple of sports features because I had friends who were on the football team at CSUN. But um, I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know anything about sports. Like I shouldn't have been hired. It was the wrong reason. I was hired because I'm sure because I was a woman. Yeah. Um, but I took advantage of that opportunity. Like no one would ever have been able to. I learned sports. My dad would go with me sometimes to a game and like explain kind of like what happened, so I could kind of gather myself together and get to the office and write. I, I was 22, you know, just still in college. And, and I loved it. Like, it was so fun. So I, I did that for about three years and worked my way up from prep and, you know, high school to college sports. And then did a lot of, uh, by the time I was doing pro, it was really the, the Dodgers and the Lakers, the Raiders, and, you know, interviewing the coaches, looking for the features. And I, I did a lot of big features out of that time. I didn't want to go on the road. didn't want to get the beat reporter, you know, um, had to spend time in the locker room, which was weirdly uncomfortable but just you know but it was fun yeah tell me about maybe the one story that stands out you did in features obviously and you know I'm a I'm a mid-40s guy who grew up in the 80s and rooted for the Celtics as you can see the hat I'm wearing but my brother's a Lakers fan so I followed and the Dodgers won the World Series in 81 and 88 and LA was a pretty big time the Wayne Gretzky comes to Los Angeles. Tell me about maybe a story that stands out for you that you wrote about during your time covering sports in Los Angeles. Um, you know, when Bo Jackson came to the Raiders, that was a big, uh, a big event. I was one of the only female reporters for sports at that time. And everyone wanted to make it, you know, this battle between Marcus Allen and Bo Jackson. That's right. And I didn't. So I, I wrote the story really, you know, honestly, and like told the real story. And so it got to where Marcus Allen would only talk to me. Like, like, I'm not, I'm only, I, if you want to know the story, you have to go through Karen because she's not going to lie about it. <laughs> so wow. I think I'll always remember that. I mean, I had several, I had an all day, you know, at, at Michael, at uh, uh, Magic Johnson's basketball camp, spent the whole day there between sets, you know, just in the gym with all these kids and just interviewing him. Nicest guy. Um, just, you know, I think I'll remember that. Just, uh, you know, the stories that he told, but lots of great times. That's good. 
uh, I had a great encounter. It was a small amount of time at ESPN when I worked there with Magic, and I can't echo that how nice he just was as a person, which is you're not something you find from every athlete that you come in contact with, for sure. Now, Don, as a coach, was that something you always wanted to do early on, getting to coaching? Was, was sports a passion for you in terms of becoming a basketball coach and eventually coming to where you've gotten to? I've always loved sports, and I just you know love playing it. And uh, coaching, I kind of fell into it, uh, but I loved it. And I loved when you see, take these young – young athletes, uh, especially high school level and even younger. I've had, I've had so much fun doing sixth grade. I mean, mm-hmm. I've coached sixth grade. I've done the gamma from fourth grade on up to the college level. And just, I love if you use sports, how they were intended, uh, working hard, knowing that they're setbacks, you're not always going to be the star, uh, applauding somebody who's better than you, hard work works, you know, and I think, uh, nowadays some of that is lost, uh, I don't like to be a naysayer. I think the athletes are still the same. I think some of the, the parents, I think if we could sit down and have clinics with parents, <laughs> as far as what, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've seen some coaches where you think, oh, I'm glad my, my kid doesn't play for that guy or that lady. Sure. But uh, I, I just, I love sports. I love when you break it down to what it is. And if you, if you don't harp on the winning and the winning, but really teach them what teamwork's all about. Like I said, and working hard and just believing in yourself. And the thing I love about it, and it's happened every year, is you see someone come in at a certain level, and by the end of the year, they've, and you can see them walking a little prouder, a little happier. And I just love that. Don, how do you handle parents that, uh, I mean, I, I could say a lot of different things about parents, but that just don't agree with you, that want to make themselves vocal and make sure they echo something that they want to get across to you. I mean, from this can start in fourth grade, unfortunately, with parents, but really as you get into high school and college and recruiting, how have you seen that world play out for you and being able to kind of work through some of the difficulties of those sports parents that are out there? You know, I think the best thing to do, and you learn, obviously, in life, you learn it as, as you get more experience and every year you get better and better. But just having a, a meeting at the beginning of the year and just telling them, obviously, with no names, but mentioning how what you literally have seen, the, the truth I've seen, how parents have just be little kids. I've had parents, as soon as games are over, they pull their kid off and they got their little stat sheet and you did this wrong and this wrong. And, you know, there's a kid yeah. just wanting to cry. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think at the beginning of the year, I, I just sit down and really talk about how many people do you know have gone on to the NBA or the NFL or whatever, and even college and what this is mainly about. And, your kid wants you to be there. I, I talk to the kid, you know, we always have team time because I think any sport you're playing, it should be more than just about the sport. Uh, my big thing has always been, I want to make productive members to society. You want them to be great fathers and great husbands. And so why do we focus so much on, you know, just the court time you got to, I want to win. Don't get me wrong. I, I love to win like everyone else, but there's got to be more to it than just this guy can dribble and shoot. And that's all I want to use him for. Yeah. So I just, I, I let the parents know up front that this is, you know, they're not going to be a star. They're not going to, I just try to do that. I'm not friendly, uh, but I'm very honest with them. And if it gets to be too much, you know, and it depends what level you're coaching, obviously, like at the high school level, you know, they can obviously quit. Yeah. And some of them have. Yeah. Oh yeah. We've heard stories. Karen Kingsbury and her husband, Don, are our guests here on Sports Spectrum today. So I got to hear the story of how you guys met. I always uh, like asking when you talk to people who have been together for a long time, what's that story behind the story, right? So, Karen, how did you guys met? How did you meet Don? Well, we were working out at the same health club, though we didn't know it, in Los Angeles. And uh, I was, you know, just on this exercise bike just like for an hour. And he just kind of kept walking by and smiling and kept catching my eye. I had to get water. I was thirsty. (laughs) Sure you were, Don. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so you just ended up getting into a conversation, ended up having a friend in common. And we talked for probably three hours. Mm-hmm. And I think the most amazing part of our story really centers around the fact that, so by the end of the night, he asked me on a date. That's not that unusual. But he said, and if you don't mind, I'd really love to bring, you know, my Bible so we could maybe read a chapter together in the Bible. Wow. <laughs> you know, like, not knowing if she was a Christian, Don? No. no. I wasn't. Wow. I wasn't. That's bold. <laughs> 
I had a denominational faith that I'd been brought up with. And, you know, my parents did the best that they could. And then they loved God and we loved God, but I never opened the Bible. Like never even considered that. I definitely did not have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And, and he did. He brought the Bible and that began, um, like we read, I think, Philippians 4. And I was so undiscerned to it. It was pretty contentious for about three months. And then I took his beautiful, beloved Bible. I threw it on the ground and broke it in the middle of one of our discussions. Like I had it. Wow. And he picked up the pieces and uh, kind of walked away. I, I, your part of the story is fun about that too. But Yeah, um, Don, at that point, I'm probably not I'm thinking that you're going to be together for a very long time <laughs> after that story right there. What well, happened? Just, yeah, I just was... I mean, I didn't know what to do. I I was saddened because I thought, okay, she's the one. I'm going to marry her. You know, she checked all the boxes, so to speak. But uh, uh, like she was saying, my family, we 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 believed in God, but we never had a relationship with the Lord. And I just got tired of, okay, this is how life is. Is this all it is? You know, you go and do this and do that, do these things. And there's got to be something more to that. So I just, I felt like the God, God tugging at my heart from the beginning. And so when I met her, it was like, you still have that choice to, Hey, I could be the cool guy. I try to impress her and, or I can just kind of say, okay, this is what I want to do. I've, I've, I know people that love the Lord and their marriages are great and, you know, nothing's perfect as you know, but it seems like they, they have things together and I want to go down that road. I, I tried to live my life without the Lord for so many years. So when I met her, I just took that chance and said, okay, let's get into the Bible. And <laughs> that day she broke it. I, I, I thought it was over. I remember I wasn't really angry. It was just more like, okay, Lord, you know, I've, I've been patient and kind and it's, it's time to move on. That's really was my thought. I was sad, but it was my thought it was like, okay, she's not the one she's obviously fighting. Mm-hmm. But she is the one. So how does that, how does that part then take the turn? Does Karen have this amazing uh, yes. come to Jesus moment as you would call it? Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. What happened was uh, I, I had driven all my life in LA past this weird little bookstore called Valley Book and Bible. And never even like, I just like, I, I mean, I, I didn't even want to like look that direction because the spiritual, you know, worker of the battle of life is so real. Mm-hmm. And so I knew where to go. So my plan was I needed to, because I, I couldn't debate the Bible. In many ways he was using, it felt like he was using scripture to kind of say, hey, you know, here are my views and, um, based on scripture. And they don't seem to line up with your views, which are kind of like man-made traditional views of some kind. So I just, you know, I, I drove to that store. I said, I need a Bible in English and I need some way to look up words because I have to look, I have to, ha- I have to have my A game. Like I couldn't debate him without knowing. So yeah. I um, got a concordance, you know, before apps. So, I mean, I'm carrying these heavy books out to the car. I didn't get out of the parking lot um, before I'm finding all the things that I thought I believed, you know, were not in scripture. And I could hear the Lord say, you can either fall away with your man-made beliefs or you can grab onto my word and never let go. And I grabbed on and I have never let go, Jason. I, I love God's word. It just is everything to me. That's an amazing story. And I'm just going to show you real quick because we're taping this on Zoom. I am act- I'm not a Bible app guy. I am an actual give me a Bible in my hand. And I'm that way with books, too, for the most part. Mm-hmm kind of guy. I wonder though, where are you guys at the stage of life? Like we talked about, you were a reporter uh, at this point, Karen in Los Angeles. Is that what you were doing during this time when you guys meet and kind of fall in love and not only with each other, but you Karen with Jesus, is this during all of this going on? Absolutely. I was a sports writer for the LA times and I really, to this day, believe that's what was he was most attracted to <laughs> was the fact that I had sideline passes. You know? <laughs> Getting I get that. That. that didn't hurt. <laughs> I bet it didn't. No. But but so this is an interesting time for you because there comes a point where you pivot away, Karen, from sports and become a writer and a novelist. And obviously that turned out to be a a a uh successful move, we'll just say, because it's been a wonderful journey for you doing that. How was that pivot and that discussion for you between you two on taking that step away from writing about sports to going into this world as a novelist? Well, by then I'd moved over to the Los Angeles Daily News. They had a full-time position and I was sports writing. And then they offered me um, a a raise and like go to the front page and do the Sunday feature. It was like Mm. pretty much the top position, like for a feature writer to take the Sunday feature. And I I mean, I was, it was a huge move. So it was kind of obvious that the answer was yes, even though it was really difficult because I was so used to 
like there's always a winner and there's always a highlight and, and it's like murder and fires and this it was a it was a tough transition emotionally that I really relied I think a lot on on Donald uh, for yeah. that but what was really fun is he was really taken up as a coach and honestly Jason he's the best basketball coach I know I love like, it I, I mean I know enough about sports I learned enough I had to so of course I knew how to score keep so my most important job during many of those years like in the next 20 years was not so much even author as it was scorekeeper for coach Don. I love it. That's great. <laughs> coach Don, that's the best kind of scorekeeper you can find, right? Exactly. <laughs> Do ministry together, work together. <laughs> so tell me about the, the idea of becoming a novelist, Karen, because it's one thing to write books. And if you're doing these features, they're almost in a way like mini books because they're, they're long form reading that you're doing. So you could have gone into just doing biographies or writing about different topics and you go into uh, being a novelist. So where does that idea kind of, where does the Lord place that on your heart to start writing novels? Well, the first four books were just what you said. I mean, my, the first book was we had just had our firstborn child and I desperately wanted a way to be home and to parent at home and write at home. Mm. You can't do that when you're a full-time front page reporter. And so my first four books, actually, and a huge answer to prayer in our life, were true crime books that came right out of my job as a front page reporter in L.A. And at the end of the fourth one, I remember we had had our second child by then. And I, I had post-it notes around the edge of the computer that were scriptures because it was I was doing murder stories. They were so sad. There was really very little redeeming value in them. Uh, they didn't cross lines of my faith, but there, and there was always like one character that kind of had maybe a faith and that helped. But after that, I thought I'm going to write a book I would want to read. And if no one buys it, so be it, Lord, it's just going to be an offering for you. And that was my book, Where Yesterday Lives. And that was my first, that was, you know, it started everything. We'll get back to our conversation with Karen Kingsbury and her husband, Don, in just a little bit. But want to tell you a little bit more about Ronald Blue Trust, all of your financial needs and questions. Ronald Blue Trust has the answers. The company's certified financial planning professionals offer comprehensive financial planning and investment management services based on biblical principles to individuals and families across the U.S. who are beyond the debt problem stage but want to be good stewards of their wealth. They are trusted. They are a voice that we trust here at Sports Spectrum. That's why we recommend them. And I know all of us have questions, especially amidst a a pandemic that hopefully is long gone, but who knows what this is going to look like for the future. But Ronald Blue Trust is awesome at putting together plans to help you reach your financial goals, whether you're in a pandemic or not. So check them out at ronblue.com to learn more. ronblue.com. Now back to our conversation with Karen Kingsbury and her husband, Don, joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. Don, take me through your mindset when she's taking this this turn as a writer and how, you know, where you are in your journey during this time too, because you're coaching, I presume at this time, um, high school, am I, am I right on that during this time? Yeah. So take me kind of from the perspective of you seeing Karen kind of make this move and where you were during this time. Well, she just, I know she's sitting here and she's my wife, but she's been an incredible writer. And I, I can remember reading her in the paper before I met her. Okay. What an incredible writer she is. And uh, so when she was talking about wanting to move on and write, and I just, I encouraged her. Uh, you had a friend too at the time that was encouraging you, you know, to, to read about real life. Cause we know as if you believe in the Lord, you have joy and your life is good, but it's not perfect. And people get cancer and people, you know, there, there's things that go wrong. And so sometimes you can read books and there's just always, and you know, what's going to happen Let's predict this ending from page five. Right. And so I love how Karen, when she writes, it's just, it's totally different. And, and uh, reading her books, I feel like I'm, I become a better father, a better husband, a better coach, a better teacher. I, I teach high school also at the time. So at that time, I was teaching and coaching and she said she wanted to do this. And I just I prayed for her and encouraged her and uh, got to watch. I think it was a year. A year went by. She submitted to yeah, almost yeah. every publisher mm-hmm. and they would all say, no, no. You know, it's a great story, but it doesn't have this. It doesn't have that. We need some of this. And I just saw her just keep being persistent, making the phone call and praying for her. I was, I was behind her a hundred percent. That's amazing. I love that. Uh, the support. So where's the, where's the moment, right, Karen, when you were like, okay, 
people are reading this, this works. This is, seems to be the, the direction that God wants me to continue going on because it's one thing to write a book. I've been privileged to write a couple now, um, but I have no idea whether when I wrote the first book that I wrote, I wrote it kind of like you did, just kind of if one person reads it, I'm going to do it because it's an important story to tell. Had no idea if anybody would read it. But for you, there's a moment, obviously, because millions and millions of people have read your books now where you realize, oh, this is, this is, this is, I hate saying it like this, but this is working. You know what I mean? Is there a moment for you where you can kind of go back and remember that? A very specific moment, actually. Um, you know, so at my first six novels were, I mean, I, we were making pennies to what I had been making as a true crime author yeah. for those four books. And even my secular agent had said, Karen, you were going to be a star. Why would you? He was from New York. He was like, couldn't believe I would switch over to, you know, inspirational or Christian fiction. He was like, this is never going to go anywhere. It was new. <laughs> you know, it was a newer thing back then. Yeah. And so the first six books, I mean, I was like, should I waitress? To, what, do I go back to waiting tables to help support our family? Or what do I do? And then I started writing the, about the Baxter family. And the Baxter family was right around the year 2000. And it just turned everything around. And I, re, I remember going to, we used to have a, conference that back in the day with all the Christian bookstores called ICRS and it was the International Christian Retail Show and I was at the Tyndale booth they would bring an author in to sign a book and it was book two in the Redemption series which is about the Baxters and you know no one knew I mean the first one I'd be standing there on the aisle like would you take a book would you, would somebody take <laughs> please, a book please somebody yeah. would somebody take a book but all of a sudden, I was showing up for my book signing, and there was a line twice around the booth, and they had a huge booth. And people were scrambling around the booth going, who's, what, Francine Rivers already spoke, what, what, who is this, like, who's, who's even up next? And all of a sudden, I like, was like, wait a minute, these are, read, so these are um, store owners, and they couldn't wait to get book two. Hmm. And it was just like chills all over my whole body, and I felt like I could hear God say, and I still feel like this, that you just have, you have no idea how big this is going to be. And just like that smile from God that, you know, you, you keep on doing it for me and, um, and I'll let you keep on doing this. You know, I love that. You That's so cool. Yeah. And obviously I think we're, are we over a hundred novels now, Karen? We're close to that, right? I think we're really close. close to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, I know it's over 25 million in print, but yeah. it's really just like, I look back and it's crazy because God has let me write so quickly. Like I write a book very quickly. So I don't even really remember doing all that writing. I, I just like remember raising our family and going to basketball games and keeping score. Right. <laughs> no. Well, you said during the pandemic, you should have written three novels. And I heard that and just kind of glanced over that and went to the next question. <laughs> I come back now and I'm thinking, that's not kind of how it worked with me writing my book. I mean, that took a lot longer than, and I, my friend, a good friend of mine, John Gordon has written a, a bunch of books too. He's a bunch of leadership books and fables. And John writes in a pretty quick way, probably a book a year which to me is just a lot. But to think about three books in just a few months, where does that come from? Is that just a gift that the Lord gave you? And, the, and Because you're writing novels too, so you have to create this, the whole story and the outcomes and all of that. I can't imagine where, where that comes from and what that's like. Can you kind of share a little bit about that, that process <laughs> that you go through in trying to write novels and doing them pretty quickly here? Yeah, I have a funny... I'll let you share a funny story after this. No, but, you share. You share it better. Well, it's just... It, it's, <laughs> The Lord puts it like a movie on my heart and it's very quick. And so I do the research. Yes. And you can do that easier, obviously, with all the virtual you know, ways that we have to do that. Now I can Google Earth, walk around a lake that I didn't have to go actually visit. Right. But, you know, I, I feel like it's just a movie in my heart and I download it as an outline and then I start writing. And the quickest one I ever wrote was even now, which was four days it took me to write. Wow. And it was about an 85, 95,000 word book and it won book of the year. So the faster I write it, the more I can clear my schedule and just give myself over to it. I always tell the readers who come up and like tears in their eyes and just, you know, your book. And I'm like, well, it's just really actually it was Jesus because, you know, he gave it to me and he gave it to me for you. I couldn't have known that. Only he could do that. Yeah. So it really is. It's just truly only him. It, it's like, and so it's so emotional for me that when um, we have moments like I'll be writing about toward the end of the book or whatever. And I, I'm like crying as I'm writing it. I just feel yeah. like first reader. And we had a time when um, he came running and he was playing ball with the boys outside. And he came in to get like a sweatshirt and I'm sitting there and I had been writing about a character who had just passed away. And I had been trying to write slowly, more slowly. So she would live a little longer. And 
she she passed. She took her last breath, and I I took my laptop and set it beside my chair, just like writing in my bedroom or our bedroom, and um, and I just had to have a good cry about losing this character. This Herbal was her name, an older woman, and so he comes running in as I'm sitting there crying, and he said, you know, it's an alarmed look, and he said, honey, what, what's wrong? What's, what happened? I said, just Herbal died. Well, he gets like you know alarmed again. He's like. Herbal? Oh no, do we know her from school or from church? And I said, honey, no, she's one of my characters. <laughs> and he like, you know, rolls his eyes all the way to the ceiling and he's like, well, I don't feel sorry for you, honey. I mean, you killed her. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy because if somebody would, would have a camera see me to this day, I'll walk in and she'll be crying. And of course, as a husband, your first thing is, are you okay, honey? But then I just... I look and I laugh because also she's on her, you know, she's typing and I know what it is. And but for her to have that deep of a, a relationship, I guess you call it with the characters. And I think that's why she's so good because literally she'll cry about some shoot. And I'm like, they have a butt you can undo, you can backspace, you can delete, you can you can keep them alive. You don't have to kill them. <laughs> You're back. Power. No, that's amazing. That's an awesome story. Thank you so much for sharing that. Karen Kingsbury, New York Times bestselling novelist, is our guest with her husband, Don, here on Sports Spectrum. Don, as we wind down, I want to ask you about faith in Christ and how sports has played an important, because this is a sports and faith show, how sports has played an important component for you in being able to share the gospel. Can you talk a little bit about the intertwining and the we like to call it the intersection of sports and faith? Mm -hmm. For me, I just, I really love, you know, it depends where you're coaching. If you're in a public school, uh, what part of the country you're in even, sure. but I just, I love that, you know, God tells us we're supposed to do our best in everything we do. We're supposed to shine for him. Uh, consider others better than yourselves. Look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. And so as a coach, if I can bring that into a team from day one of a practice that nobody is better or less than anybody here. Now we all have different talents. Like I said, it's, it's a blending thing. There are, there are some guys that are going to rise and they're going to be better players. But as far as a human being, as far as your, your worth, we're all equal. And if you can get people to understand that and, and to show and I think that's why it's important as a coach, you have to know your players from your starting five down to whatever your roster is. You've got the 15 man roster that that 15th guy has to know that you love them and that he's worth something. He's valuable. And I think uh, with sports, you know, bringing all that together, you know, because some people say, well, you can't mix, you know, Jesus with sports. Yes, you can. Oh, absolutely. And I think it, it's very humbling to us, too. You know, G Jesus wants us humble more than anything. If our heart, if we're not humble, we're, we're no good for the kingdom. And sometimes in sports, it's so humbling, uh, losing or trying to do something different that nobody believed in and you find out it didn't work. And then there's other times where you do something different and it does work. So I, I just really think that carrying Christ with me all the time and, and you know, you got to be careful and be aware of who's there. And you got to, the Bible says we're supposed to be sly, right? We're supposed to know what's going on. And, and so I think the players know where I, where I come from, where I stand. They also know that I'm fair. Uh, it's not a club in my mind. Oh, you're a Christian. Okay. You're going to get playing time. You're not, that's never entered it. You just, you have to represent yourself as Christ represented himself. And he loved everybody equally to the point of, people on the cross spitting on him and throwing stuff at him. And he said, forgive them. Yeah. And uh, that's what I try to do as a coach. Did you find when you were at Trevecca, uh, your last coaching job, and that was college, obviously. So it's a little different for you being in college versus high school, but also being at a faith based school, it was different in how you went and coached, knowing that the faith component not necessarily had to be hidden, but you had to be, uh, smart, I guess, in the way that you would work that in there. Did you notice a little bit of a difference in the way that you could coach when you're at a school that is faith-based school? Oh, yes. Different. Yeah. I loved it. I love <laughs> I love being able just to be open and not knowing if it's going to come back to bite you and you have to have a meeting with the AD and this and that. So <laughs> I love that a lot. Yes. It's, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's a perfect situation for me. A, a university that's, that believes in the Lord or a high school, that, yeah. that's perfect. That's awesome. I want to wind down here, Karen, and ask you about your latest novel. Uh, it's called Someone Like You. It was released May 5th in the midst of a pandemic. And something really cool came out of that because I, I wonder, 
for you, you've had so many books that have come out, none that have ever come out in a pandemic, I presume, because we haven't had a pandemic in our yeah. lifetimes. So that had to be unique, but that really opened up opportunities and some kind of um, really amazing things that have happened because of the book release. Can you tell us a little bit about Someone Like You and then all that took place after it? Yeah, well, Someone Like You is a, a story of embryo adoption. So it's really interesting. As a reporter, I ended up, I was early on, one of the first people who wrote about frozen babies on ice. I mean, these embryos that came, you know, eventually later it became something you could adopt an embryo. Yeah. So I decided to write a story. It's a love story about that. It's a story of heartache and forgiveness and um, also second chances. And it's got just a lot of beautiful hope in it. So my publisher had Simon and Schuster, they had said, we're not going to publish a lot of books, just like movies and a lot of movies were held because of the pandemic bookstores were all closed. It's kind of a bad time to release a book. Yeah. But we are going to release yours because we think your book will give them hope. And we think it's just what they need. Wow. So, you know, that meant that my staff and I, like, we needed to really do our A game because it was all going to be virtual. It was all online sales, online marketing, online reaching people with the message of the book. And in the midst of that, I had to, of course, cancel my tour that I would have had. And I had to cancel with a bookstore called uh, Landmark Booksellers. And Landmark is in downtown Franklin, Tennessee. It's an iconic bookstore run by a couple, Joel and Carol. And I actually wrote a book called The Bridge about a bookstore saved by the town when they experience a flood. That was what it was about. It became a hit Hallmark movie. Hmm. And it was totally inspired by Landmark. So now something worse than a flood that I could never have imagined, a pandemic. And I call and I say, hey, how are y'all doing? Because... I know I'm not going to have my tour there and, you know, just want to check in on you. And I hear the, the break in the voice and we're not, we're not going to make it. Like we're on our knees. We don't know what to do. We are begging God for a way to make it. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, would you mind putting my book on a pre, I'll, I'll direct my readers to pre-order it from you. I mean, a small bookstore is going to be full price. It won't be Amazon. It may not get to you as quickly, but I think I can get some people to buy the book ahead of time if you would put it up. So they got their guy to put it on their website and I shared that with my readers and 6,112 people bought someone like you from Landmark Booksellers, which was, wow. uh, it was such a praise. But what it turned us into, I mean, they, Carol and Joel couldn't handle packaging 6,112 books. So we ended up turning our home into a book distribution place for two, for two weeks. Yes. You were kind of in charge of it. Yes. Yeah. It's crazy. Wow. Don, what was that like? Oh, it was fun and it was hard. <laughs> I mean, we had to, everything from, you know, putting the labels on to having her, she had to sign over 6,000 books, you know, and packaging them up, putting them in the mail bags, taking them down so they can get mailed off. And it was a lot of fun. It was, it was hectic, but it was fun. It was one of those things that you look back and you think that was great. And then, plus, like you said, helping people, anytime you can help somebody, how can it not be fun? Right. Just yeah, it saved the bookstore. I mean, it, they really, they literally said, I mean, they said that they brought in more than a year's worth of income in that time. So Wow. <laughs> That's praise God. That is awesome. I've been actually, I think, to that bookstore. I went to downtown Franklin one time. It was this past, I don't know when it was, October or November. My wife's a big Tennessee Titans fan. So I had to take her for our anniversary, our 20th anniversary to mm -hmm. Nashville, took her to a Titans game. And our friend of ours um, has an office in downtown Franklin. And we were went and just kind of hanging out with him. He's like, go take, take a walk downtown. I think you'll really like this place. And it was awesome. And we, end, I, we ended up in a famous bookstore from Franklin. I had, presume it was this one because I don't remember the name, but it had to be Landmark. Yeah. And uh, so that's pretty cool how kind of things come full yeah. circle there. Very cool story. Uh, Karen Kingsbury and her husband, Don, are our guests. Thank you so much, guys. This has been fabulous. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, Karen, thanks for all you've done with all your books and Don for all the pouring into different people, young people in your journey as well um, and for standing for the Lord. So thanks to, you, thanks to you both for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. It's been our pleasure. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. If anyone wants to read our story or anything else, just KarenKingsbury.com. They can find out all of that. Absolutely. KarenKingsbury.com. Thanks, guys. All, all right. right. Be blessed. Bye-bye. And many thanks to Karen Kingsbury and her husband, Don, for joining us here on Sports Spectrum today. Lots of great stuff there, right? I mean, between how they met, between her throwing the Bible on the floor and saying, I don't want anything to do with this thing, and God ordaining them to be together and get married, and now been married for a very long time, for over 
30 years. And I love the stories early on from Karen about covering sports and doing a feature on Bo Jackson and, and Magic Johnson and just kind of what that life was like early on. And then the story of her saving her book, Someone Like You Helping Save a Bookstore uh, in Franklin, Tennessee. I mean, come on, that is an amazing story. And I loved my conversation with these guys. I really did. A special shout out to my friend James Morrison, who knew uh, Karen and Don and actually recommended them for the podcast. And James, I know, works and does great work with managers on a mission. And so this is just a public thank you to James for the introduction to Karen and Don. This was a lot of fun. So I appreciate Karen and Don for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. We also appreciate our sponsors, Ronald Blue Trust. Check them out over at ronblue.com for any financial needs or matters or questions you might have. They do great work based on biblical principles. That is the key here with Ronald Blue Trust is they do their work with a biblical lens. Check them out at ronblue.com. Again, check out our website as well, sportspectrum.com. You can find all of our content there over at the website. Make sure you bookmark it, sportspectrum.com, and then subscribe to this podcast. Whatever app you're listening to this show on, please click that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum. Lots of great stories on this podcast for the last three years, over 500 episodes, and we just love being a part of your journey as you listen to the show, and we thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. we got a brand new episode coming your way the next time right here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. I do hope you all have a great rest of your day, and please do stay safe. <laughs>